did a hybrid half uh, online, half in-person seminar. So there's about one, two, three, four, five of us here in the audience. Um, I hope you can hear us okay. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions along the way or set it up in the chat and I, I can ask each on. And uh, otherwise, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bishan Jessalon, who is now with us here at the Czech Academy of Sciences, and he will talk about stably projectionless Frese limits. Go ahead, Bishan. Thank you, Karen. Uh, very nice to be here in Prague. Um, thank you uh, for being here in person with me. Um, I spent the past year in a basement in Nova Scotia talking to myself. So uh, forgive me if I say things that you already know. And please do interrupt um, if I say anything questions. Uh, okay, so let me, here's the, the, the setting. It is uh, continuous model theory. Um, for metric structures, uh, whatever that is. I'm going to tell you um, or remind you probably what a Fresse category is. Um, but really, we're just going to be using the language of tracial C star algebras. So C star algebras with um, tracial states. And um, over this language, a Fresse category, so a by the way, I don't actually know how uh, Fresse pronounced his name, so I'm going to say Fresse. Um, so Fresse category uh, A, um, so it consists of so some objects which are finitely generated um, L structures. So objects. You know, again, whatever that means, but um, I'm soon going to just focus on some uh, very specific objects. Um, so we have some objects, and maybe you want the word separable in there somewhere. I don't know. Take it up with the nearest Alessandro. Um, and we want some uh, morphisms. So for every um, pair of objects, you want some collection of L embeddings. And um, so to be a Fresse category, you want some properties to hold. And the properties you want are um, what's called the Cauchy continuity property, the weak. Polish property, the joint, um, I want to say expectation, and that's not it, joint embedding property, and the uh, near approximation property. Okay, so I'll just say that this one, the Cauchy continuity property, is automatic uh, with this language. So I'm not going to say anything more about this, it's just automatic. And I'll uh, say some things about the other ones um, shortly. All right, so that's what a first category is. I uh, will focus on some very specific ones right now. Uh, but the fact is, um, yeah, sorry. This CCP is the Cauchy continuity property, whatever that means, but just it's automatic in our set. Uh, and this is the weak Polish property and the, the joint embedding property and the near approximation property. Uh, but but I'll, I'll spell the other uh, three out so, in, in due time. Okay, uh, right, so the fact is, uh, I'm not really sure who to attribute this to, but there is a, um, there's a paper by Shuhei Matsumoto where this is spelled out. And the fact is that Fresse category has a unique Fresse limit. So such a category has a unique uh, Fresse limit. 
And by that, I mean, if there is an inductive limit object, Uh, whether the AIs are objects in the Gaussian defines morphisms, um, that is that has two properties. First of all, it's what's called K universal. So that means that um, every object can be what's called K admissibly embedded into the limit. So every object. Uh, embedded um there k admissible is some technical restriction on the allowable embeddings you want into here that i don't really understand take it up with the um, but just in our context it is automatic this is not really something that's work uh so that's it can be embedded in essentially uniquely it's k universal and um, approximately homogeneous. Is that right? Um, that just means that this, these embeddings are essentially unique. So if you give me two such and you give me a finite set, an epsilon, there is an automorphism of the limit that moves one onto the other. So uh, given a finite set, an epsilon, and two embeddings of an object k admissibly into the limit. Uh, there is uh, a k uh, k admissible automorphism. Um, I don't know phi of m such that for every f f the uh, one is mapped onto the other, up to epsilon. Okay, so that, that's what the Fresse category is sort of in general, and um, this is what a Fresse limit is. Um, so now what I want to focus on is uh, two specific Fresse categories. Okay, so should I use this to, let's, let's see if we can do this. Munster style. Right, so, um, well, man, this one. I, I mentioned in the uh, abstract, I was going to tell you that uh, two specific algebras are press limits. And these are the ones that I call W and that zero. So these are uh, simple, separable. They are stably projectionless, meaning that. They have no item potents, even after sensing with the compact operators. And they have um, finite ether dimensions, so they are classifiable. And um, they are sort of 
analogs of O2 and O infinity. So one, in one way, in sense in which that's true is that the invariant of W is the same as the invariant of O2, the K-theoretic part. Anyway. So the K0 group is zero and the K1 group is, is zero. And the Z0, uh, it's the same as O infinity. So the K0 group is Z and the K1 group is zero. Um, and the stability projection, so the positive component is zero. Uh, so I called Z0 Santiago's algebra, because to my knowledge, Luis Santiago is the first person who um, constructed this guy. So he, I gave a talk 10 years ago in, in Barcelona. And he, he called it Q, I think. But um, you'll also see this with this notation in this uh, Elliott New Gonglin paper. And what they, this is very important in their classification of stable projection of C set algebras. And um, they, what they do is they have this, this class of algebras that they're considering and they say Z0 is the one in the class with the right invariant. So it's not, they don't really give a, an explicit construction of it, but that, so that's what I will kind of show you now. Um, so, so, right. So let's get to the, the categories of which these objects will be uh, press a, the unique press alone. All right, so the categories. Um, so first of all, a W, the objects are pairs um, A and K and so, so A and K is an algebra that looks like this. It's uh, continuous functions from the interval, the matrices, uh, such that on the left, it's uh, just diagonal with some A's, and on the right, it's diagonal with the same A's, but with a with a dimension drop. So that's what makes it stably projectional. This um, dimension drop here, uh, and the A should be in a M K. Uh, so okay, so that's what A and K is, and tau is a faithful diffuse trace on A and What I mean by uh, faithful diffuse trace is every trace on this algebra is given by a probability measure. I, I want that probability measure to be faithful and diffuse. Oh, I'm not making a horrendous mess. Well, I am, but please. All right. So I'll just write what I just said there. I mean that. So every trace will look like this. Uh, where so this is a probability version, I want it to be faithful and diffuse. So no at no atoms. All right, so these are the uh, objects. I'll get to the morphisms shortly. Let me tell you what the objects for the other one are. So for the, the Z0, Category objects are very similar, except let's call them B and K. So tall will again be a faithful diffuse trace, but B and K look like this. So again, it's 
continuous functions from the interval, this time to m to n a. And it's going to be just like this, except it's going to be a's and b's. So f0 is a bunch of a's and a bunch of b's. And f1 is a bunch of a's, then a 0, and a bunch of b's, and a 0. So there's still this uh, dimension drop up there. So a and b are in mk. Okay, so these both have trivial k1. This one, it's k0 is, is also trivial. This one, it's k0 is, is dead. All right, so that's what the uh, objects are. And I think actually in that Gongland paper, they do, I think, mention that Z0 can't be constructed from these building blocks, but we'll, we, we do it very explicitly. All right, so the uh, morphisms, are uh, just so an object is a pair of off morphism is just a star morphism from one to the other that maps the trace to this trace. So these are just trace preserving uh, star homomorphisms. So what I mean is I goes from a n1 k1 to a n2 k2 or b2 k2. And the pullback of uh, tor two is tor one. Uh, both for um, the A's and the B's, we want trace preserving tor right. um, Oh, uh, well, actually, okay. So we want trace preserving. Also, we want it to be um, the identity on K theory, um, just, uh, such that K zero of phi is the identity. Um, so that's no restriction here because there is no K theory. But here we do want to keep track. So what I mean by the ident identity, we map a generator to a generator. And um, you know, <laughs> something is a bit counterintuitive about stable projection at least for algebras. So the K0 is, is dead, but there is no positive cone. So th there is an automorphism that maps one to Minus one. Minus one is not negative. Um, so I, and did, I mean, that's just what you do is just swap the A's and B's. That's, that's it. When I say map to generator to generator, it could map one to one or one to minus one doesn't. All right. So those are the morphisms. are um, equivalently, they are what we call diagonal morphisms. So they are of the form phi f is some unitary conjugate of f composed of. A bunch of so you can you can show that uh, these are trace preserving is equivalent to that. Um, the unitaries you can uh, so the the, the psi is are continuous and the unitaries are not guaranteed to be, but you can preserve them to be if, if you want to. You sometimes want to. Okay, so now let me tell you a bit about the um, the the key fact, the key lemma that makes uh, all of this work, and that is um, the existence of transport maps. And uh, that's one of the nice things about having faithful diffuse traces, because we can find transport. I'll, let me explain what I mean. All right. So the lemma. Is this so? For any, um, let's say, new, new 
measures faithful diffuse on the interval. Uh, there is a homeomorphism of the interval mapping one. So homeomorphism that um, also preserves the endpoint. So H0 zero is zero, H1 is one, uh, such that H, uh, no, how does it go? It's a push forward. Okay. Hmm. All right, so uh, by this, I mean um, H star, Mu applied to some Borel set is mu of the pre image of that. Okay, how, how, the, how, what, what is this map? Um, you just, uh, you take the, the cumulative density functions of these measures. So let's say F mu is measure of mu zero t and same for mu. And you take H to be, uh, you know, it's either going to be this way or the other way. I don't know, but something like that. Whatever makes sense. You pretty much, prefer, uh, whatever. Okay, something like that. So this is a well known map in the study of um, transportation theory. This is what's called the increasing rearrangement map. And, um, it is sort of the best uh, behaved transport map that you can hope for. Okay, so because of this P lemma, that means, so for all of this, that if you give me, you fix a building block A and K or B and K, and you consider maybe two different traces on it, we can find an automorphism in the algebra that maps one to the other. So uh, for any um, A, that's either an A and K or B and K and um, any two, let's write like this, faithful diffuse traces, there is an automorphism um, like this. Uh, let's say phi from A sigma to A top. And the phi is that you just take the, uh, the home of them in, induced by this uh, map. So phi is just H the, right, that, that's why preserving the, the boundary points is important so that you actually do get a map from this algebra, which has boundary conditions to itself. Okay, so this fact now implies the weak Polish property. So the weak Polish property is some kind of separability condition. And what this tells you, let me write this up. All right. Quick question, Bishan. Yep. Uh, for this, you just need that you have a homeomorphism that transports the measure from one measure to another. It doesn't need to be optimal in any other. Not in any sense. Oh. Although, although um, it is possible to you make use of that fact. So what, what Karen's pointing out is that um, you can um, you can say more than this. Uh, not only is there measure mapping uh, map mapping one to the other, but the you can control the variation of this map um, by the distance between these two measures. In a sense that I'll actually get to shortly. All right, so this okay, this implies the weak Polish problem. Uh, which 
what, um, what this tells you is that the, uh, if you look at the collection A, um, A where uh, A is an object, and uh, so object, remember, means a, a pair, a building block and a trace. And this is a generating set size n. Um, this has countably many isomorphism blocks because there are just countably many of these possible building blocks. And this tells us that there is only one trace up to bottom of them. That's why. Right. So uh, this has countably many uh, isomorphism classes. And this, which I haven't actually told you exactly what the weak for the property says, it's some kind of separability condition, but this is fine. Um, in fact, this also gives you the joint embedding property. So let me tell you what that, let me spell that one out for you. So the joint embedding property, uh, what you want is if you give me two objects, A1 sigma 1, A2 sigma 2. So these are either the ANKs or BNKs, and these are faithful diffuse traces. You want to find some other object into which they both embed. You want to find some uh, B talk. Got it. So the joint embedded property is given these two objects. You want to find a state into which they both embed, hence the name. And how do you do this? So uh, we have a variety of maps between building blocks that we consider. There's lots of flexibility for shuffling things around at the endpoints as necessary. So it is not hard to find a common building block into which these embed, first of all, ignoring what happens to trace. So um, we, we uh, have, explicit uh, ways, which I'm not going to get into, but they are um, these kind of diagonal maps that I told you about. They we can say explicitly what the continuous functions are. Explicit ways of embedding. Uh, so let's say A1 and A2 jointly overload. A1 and A2 into some B. All right. You think? Okay. All right. Okay. So what we do is embed these two um, in, in our explicit ways. And then we just need to pay attention to what happens on traces. So what we do is just take, for example, the Lebesgue measure, and then you see, so let's give these some names, uh, phi one, phi two. So you just see, I mean, so phi one and phi two, they are, as I said, explicit um, diagonal maps. They will pull back this trace onto some trace, namely, um, they're just the composition. So lambda composed with uh, sigma one, right? But just by definition, not sigma one, phi one, sorry. So phi, so phi one composed with lambda, it's the trait. And similarly, so this is a one, a two, lambda composed with phi two. Uh, and now we just apply, apply the automorphism. So now we just take this back to A sigma one using this, uh, this isomorphism, and then you pull this back to A sigma two using this isomorphism. So, so that, that's why I'm really calling this the, the key fact. It gives you um, a lot of what you want. Okay, so the remaining things are, we need to prove the near, near approximation property 
and um, we need to show that these limits that we construct um, have the, the universality and homogeneity problem. Say what we do. I'll, I'll come to the near approximation problem in a second. So, right, so so far I've just told you what the categories are, and I've pointed out that the Cauchy continuity property, the weak Polish property, and the joint empiric property, they're taken care of. So there's one left, one thing left to prove we have a press A category, and then a couple of things left to show that the limits we construct are the unique press A limits. So um, what we do is, And we construct. Oh, hmm. I'll show. so we construct limits uh, a and i k i and some connecting ops and same for the b's. Some other connecting ops. And we can say explicitly what they look like. Um, that are so-called generic. Generic means uh, two things. First of all, and, and these two properties which I'll write will imply that uh, the limits we have are, the, um, are the, the, the limits we want. So firstly, any object, so um, any, uh, that's all I mean, C tor um, can be embedded, K admissibly embedded or whatever can be embedded. Um, into some uh, AI uh, tor. Okay. So what I mean is you just, these numbers, you just choose them sensibly, you build in, throw in as many factors as you need so that any building block with any, so and this will be any um, AML or, or BML will fit in somewhere along the line. Just build enough factors into these numbers and that, that'll do it for you. Uh, and this will um, imply the, uh, the universal, universality property. So the second thing is I'll just draw a diagram. So here's the limit. Um, I, A, A. So the, the limit. So it, it, this is the, the limit we construct. And suppose you have a map from some AI down to some C's. I'm, I'm omitting the, the traces, just the readable. So suppose you have some uh, map going down here. What you want is to construct some other map coming up, such that give me an F, an epsilon, this will commute uh, um, up to epsilon on F. So these two properties um, are enjoyed by our limits. And um, th these imply the, uh, the properties that the um, the first element has. Um, so I'll just so to prove this is just throwing you know factors. This is proved in the same way as, as the near approximation property. So that's what I'll get. So this follows from the same argument. Uh, used to prove the near approximation problem. So let me tell you what the near approximation property is. Um, by the way, so I mentioned also in the abstract that we consider W and we consider Z0, and we consider Z0 tensored with UHF algebras of infinite type. Um, first of all, if you tensor W with a UHF algebra of any type, you just get W by classification. Uh, but suppose you wanted to um, include Z tensor UHF, you use the same building block, except you require the, the K the zero maps not to be trivial, but to uh, be a divisor of super, supernatural number. 
that, that's the only restriction. And as I say, we have lots of room to construct maps that, that do that. Uh, okay, so that, that's all I'll say about that. Let me tell you about the mayor approximation problem. So, uh, I mean, the way I like, I mean, I don't know anything about model theory really. Uh, so I just like to think of this as basically local existence, but people who study classification for local existence, their approximation property is locally. It's just, um, it's, it's just so much nicer and easier in this setting when you have these uh, faithful diffuse traces because faithful diffuse traces are just, just the best. By the way, when should I stop? Okay. All right, so their approximation property, local uniqueness, it's about completing a certain diagram. Um, so if you give me two embeddings. So um, let's say you start with some A sigma and you're given uh, embeddings into A1 sigma one and A2 sigma two, and you're given a, a finite set and an epsilon, you want to be able to find some B tall uh, such that this commutes up to F on epsilon. So you're given, you're given this, and this, and the F and the epsilon you want to find this and these and that. Um, so actually what we do is um, we, we complete this diagram so that we get agreement on K theory and traces, and then we conjugate one map by a unitary in the unitization, so by an automorphism of this algebra. Um, so let me just uh, brief aside on unitary orbits. Because um, that's what comes into play here. We, as I said, we take we find a unitary that maps one to the other. Um, so we are discussing the unitary orbits of two star homomorphisms. That's one way of thinking about. Um, so let me just tell you a theorem. Uh, it's myself and uh, Aaron and Andrew Toms. So A is a simple, separable. Uh, exact um, Z-stable T-square algebra. So it um, tensorially absorbs the Chang-Tu algebra. Uh, then, um, for any, if you give me two uh, positive contractions, so AB, um, that have no spectral gaps, the reason you want um, no spectral gaps is because you don't have to talk about K theory. Uh, so the distance between the unitary orbits of A and B is equal to the optimal matching distance between A and B, and it's equal to the Kuhn's distance between A and B. So this uh, is the distance between the unitary orbits, so it's the infimum over uh, u in the unitary of the, maybe the unitization of a minus u, the u star. And delta a, b, th this is what I, I, I really want to talk about for a little bit because I, another thing I mentioned in the abstract was I wanted to uh, speculate on some uh, extensions of what we're doing here to, well, Okay, I said in the abstract, LP operator algebra, but what I actually meant and what I'm going to say is non commutative LP space is something different. That's my apology. Right. Um, this delta is what I call 
the optimal matching distance. And it looks like this. Delta between two, uh, so yeah, delta AP is the supremum over all traces of delta between the, uh, so each trace on the algebra restricted to the um, C star algebra generated by A gives a trace on that sub C star algebra. So it's a measure on the spec. Uh, that's what I mean by this. And so this delta between two measures, it's this, it's the supremum, no, the, not the supremum, the theme of z r is bigger than zero, such that mu u is at most mu u r, and the other way around, mu u is at most mu u r uh, for every open mu. Uh, by by U R, I just mean the um the R extension, so the set of things that are, are at most distance R from uh U. Okay, so why is this thing the right thing to consider in this context? It comes from matrices. So if we have in be just matrices, uh, you know, positive uh, then um, it's an application of Paul's marriage there that uh, what this thing is telling you, it's just the optimal way of pairing the eigenvalues together. So this delta AB in that context is the uh, min over permutations, the uh, max over indices of the difference between the Eigenvalues. Sorry, so that's why this is a reasonable thing to look at. And um, it's a classical theorem of while that this distance between the eigenvalues is exactly the unitary distance between the uh, elements. Um, so, so that's why this complicated look thing is the right thing to look at. Um, all right. But I always found this a little bit unsatisfactory. Um, when I uh, when I first started talking about Andrew talking with Andrew about this years ago, Andrew called this the levy proper of this. And it is kind of like but not quite the levy proper of distance. The levy proper of distance would be if you had a plus R here. Okay, so this distance is um, a bigger distance. And it is not this, so what you always need to be comfortable is that it does not give a metrization of the weak star topology on measures um, if there are atoms. So this thing, even though it is the right thing to look at in the context of C star algebra, it, it is not. It does not non metrization of the weak star topology. Uh, but in the that's if you have atoms. Um, okay, there are a couple of ways of uh, making me sleep at night about this. Um, firstly, you can in the classifiable settings when you have that stability you can uh, dissolve the atom. So you can perturb things such that you just make the atoms disappear. So that's fine. In that case, yes, it is a matrization restricted to the good measures and the this ones. That's nice. Uh, but, um, so, uh, so Andrew called this a levy proper of distance. It's not quite. I mean, I was giving a talk about this in U of P uh, and Robert McCann, who's a, like a big figure in the optimal transport world is there. And he told me, but I, was, I said, okay, Going to define this funny looking thing, which is almost not quite the proper of this. And he said, well, it's just the infinity vast kind of that, That's what this actually is. So delta is the infinity, or what's the called the infinity vast kind of All right. So I'm just, oh, you know, I'm telling you, it's not this one obscure name, it's this other obscure name. But the point is, there is a whole family of vast kind of And the other ones, they do uh, give metrizations of the we start to follow. So from that point of view, those other ones might be something to look at. Uh, it, and it turns out that um, you can look at that, except 
it's not going to give you the unitary distance with respect to the C star norm, because that's given by the infinity one. It's going to be the unitary distance with respect to the Schatten P norm. Um, that's where the non commutative LT spaces come into play. So um, maybe just for the sake of time, I will just say, uh, yeah, for the sake of time, I will just say that all of what we're saying, what I'm saying here, so you can replace. So whilst, let's call this W infinity. So you can replace uh, W infinity by WP, one less than equal to P less than infinity, um, which I'm not going to define for the time reason. But um, at the cost, so the good thing about that is these are nice. They give metrizations with weak topology, but you have to replace the uh, C star norm. Um, so cost of uh, so this uh, P instead of the C star. And what I what I mean by this is just let's say we have a unique trace. You just take um, so you know, X would be uh, trace. It's like the LP norm with respect to the trace. So it's traced the uh, absolute value of X to the P to the one over P. So th this is the the in the context of matrices. This is the exactly the the Schatten P norm. Uh, okay. All right, so that, that's all I'll, I'll say about that. Okay, let me um, let me show that now. So let me maybe leave this. And right, okay, let me tell you a okay, fair. And so the, the theorem is uh, not really anything profoundly new. It's just um, a nice way of putting things. So I'm going to really guess. I mean, this is effectively this is a result of Thompson. Uh, but the way I'm going to phrase it, it's, it'll be in the paper that um, with, with me and I'll talk. Okay, so let's say um, A is uh, C01, maybe with tensor sub matrix, matrix factor. And um, let's let B be a one dimensional long commutative TW complex. So let's say it looks like this. So functions to some MK such that we have some boundary conditions. So, F0 is phi of A, uh, F1, so phi 0 of A, F1 is phi 1 of A. Um, and yeah, A is meant to live in some finite dimensional uh, algebra. Right, so it, it's just like an ANK or a BNK functions in the interval to matrices with boundary conditions. Uh, okay, so that's. Um, the set up and suppose you have uh, two diagonal star homomorphisms from A to B. So let phi phi from A to B be diagonal. Sorry, okay. E is a finite dimensional C star. So E in the context of an ANK or a BNK would just be the K by K matrix. So it's something that's built in the definition of whatever B is. Uh, then the, the, the conclusion is that, um, so what, what I'm going to say is, um, local uniqueness holds basically, uh, but just so in in the setting of classification of inductive limit C star algebras, the way that uh, local uniqueness works basically is you say, all right, I have two maps and the eigenvalues are pointwise close, therefore 
they can be pointwise unitary conjugated one with the other and use your favorite argument to patch together the unitaries and pay attention to the end uh, So the only point that I'm going to make here is that yes, that's what you can do, but you can be a lot more precise about how close the eigen, because by Vile's term, the eigenvalues, is it, is it not just comparable to, it's exactly unitary distance. So what we can say is uh, the unitary distance measured with respect to one Lipschitz functions is the Kuntz distance between the images of the identity function. And it's also the Kuntz distance relative to the one Lipschitz functions. All right, let me, let me explain it a little bit. So by this, I mean the int over all unitaries, uh, the soup over one Lipschitz functions of the, the same thing. So 5f minus u i f u star. So this, this is the end of the thing. So what is this saying? This is saying, if you take the images of the identical maps, this will tell you how close the eigenvalues are. Point that, that, well, I'm not going to even, so this dw is um, sort of like the, it's like the delta that I defined, except defined with the Kuntz semigroup instead of the measures. It's the same sort of thing, just relative to the Kuntz semigroup. So this tells you eigenvalues are close. Um, and therefore, just this is just basically an application of file theorem, just as I said, done uniformly across the interval. And so what this is saying is you want one unitary to map all the Lipschitz functions onto the, uh, the other image uh, in the other map. That's a reasonable thing to ask for because it's a compact set. That, that's, what, that's what's going on here. So, I mean, you could use um, not just one Lipschitz functions, but any compact set of functions, and this would be true. Uh, but, uh, well, maybe take that back slightly. But um, the reason that this is a nice one, the one Lipschitz functions, because they, they generate the Kuntz semigroup of this set. So every, every Kuntz class in here is a supremum of um, classes of, uh, of one Lipschitz. Um, okay, so this is just the same sort of local uniqueness that you see all the time, just paying attention to what Biles can tell. And I'll just say that I'm going to have a similar sort of thing. Well, okay, no, I'm going to do that. Uh, okay, so last thing I will say is that, um, you know, so this is almost like, um, this almost gives us an error approximation problem. Basically, what we do is we can complete this diagram. Uh, so we are given these maps. We complete the diagram using our variety of maps such that we have agreement on k theory and traces. So we get exact agreement on k theory and traces. So this map pulls tau back to sigma. This map pulls tau back to sigma. They agree on k theory. And then we just post compose. So let's see, uh, b prime tau prime. Um, it, it, we just go far enough along such that not just this one trace gets mapped onto here, but all traces get mapped approximately onto here. And then that'll tell us that this guy is small, dw is small, if you pay attention to the definition, and that'll tell you that du is small, which means in other words that we can find a unitary in here that conjugates this onto that on a finite or, or even compact. All right. Uh, right, okay, so that, that almost gets us to, to not accept. Our domain is not the right thing. Our domain is C01 hence MN. Uh, but Lionel tells us, so Lionel Robert in his classification of the uh, limits of um, one dimensional CW and CW, you know what I mean? Um, he says that given an A and K or a B and A, we can reduce it to this guy by a sequence of steps. So we can reduce. A and K or B and K to uh, C01, maybe with some um, copies of C tacked on uh, via, uh, you're allowed to do one of three things. So you're allowed to add a unit, you can remove a unit, 
or um, stabilized movement. So if you read the NLS paper and you follow his instructions by, the, for example, these two algebras, it'll give you an explicit way of essentially shuffling things around at the endpoint suitably to get via these steps to there. Um, yeah, and in fact, it's not just any old stabilizing problem. It's in fact accomplished by some unitary in, in B of H. It's just shuffling things around. So in, in particular, um, it's going to, so what I want to say is, Take the Lipschitz functions in here and just see where they go according to these steps. So all the steps you need to do to get here, add a unit, draw the unit, whatever. All of these are witnessed by some unitary. So just the image of lip one functions in here or here, let's call that G. So G equals image of lip one uh, um, of these steps. And if you just chase that through, what you get, uh, it is now, basically. Okay, so you just, you know, this is phrased for C01, you just reduce it to what you actually want. Um, so you'll get a statement like this, except with not with lip one, but with this G, okay, so that, that's it. Um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to say. Um, yeah, so would you get corollary? Um, that, and then the, the, the final, final corollary is that, um, so finally, uh, W is the unique uh, Fresse limit because it has all the properties of the category KW and Z0 of uh, KZ0. Uh, all right, so now, final, final thing. So this uh, appealing to Leonel, I, I really, really like because Leonel provides you a way of tidying up the uh, messy combinatorics that would be involved if you tried to do this explicitly. If you started with an A and K here, you could try to prove something like this. Um, it'll be a nightmare, I guarantee. If you read uh, Razak's, well, okay. <laughs> I, personally, I find that. If you read Razak's paper, it's, it's, uh, which is what he does basically, he, it goes from A and case to other A and case. It's a lot of different, uh, a lot of complex involved, and I'm not great. Um, okay, so that that yeah, that follows. Delivery has NAP joint yeah. all of this, so it has a unique price limit. Yeah. But still, you need to show that this unique price limit is isomorphic to Razak Jason and Jebra or is it's immediate. So, I mean, so you want to show that these have, these two limits, so because fact have the two properties, the uh, the admissibility one, so every block can be embedded into the limits we construct, uh -huh. essentially uniquely. Uh -huh, you okay. need that, but you're absolutely right. That's something you need to prove. But that's proved in the same lines as, as now. Uh, oh. uh, and also, okay, here also traces are very important. Mm -hmm. So how about in the noun trace, trace list cases like Kuhn's algebra? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. Because also for uh, Z also? Oh, for, for Z, yes. this is um, yes. much more also, yes. I think... Um, so I'll, I'll say the, the reason this that Kang and I were doing this is, is we were trying to prove that W tends to W, W, Z0 tends to Z0, Z0. And maybe I should have mentioned that these two algebras have these properties. Um, these are the so-called, they should be the so-called stably projectionless, um, strongly self-absorbing C3 algebras. To prove that they are self-absorbing is very difficult. So you need the full force of classification. This is what Elliot and Neil and Gong and Lin did for both of these things. So believe me, I, I, I tried a lot to prove this. And we were thinking that if we were able to incorporate not just the ANKs, but the tensor products as well into the same category, uh, then by unique express elements, we would have W tensor W is one, W is one, therefore they have to be isomorphic, but that's 
I think actually Said said that yes. for the Jiang Su algebra. But things are wildly different in the non unital case. So if you have a unital sister algebra, you are guaranteed maps from A to A times A, just embed into one factor or the other. It, there's no such thing in the non unital. <laughs> That's basically what makes this very, very difficult. Um, but okay. Okay, thank you. It's like Hannes has a question. So, Hannes, if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Um, am I unmuted already? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, great. So, you kind of answered my question already. So, I oh. wanted to ask if you can use this to show that these algebras are self absorbing. Yeah. Um, but you said what the difficulty is. Um, but doesn't Leonel's result give you a map from R to R tensor R? I mean, you, R is in his class and our tensor R has their rank one. Yeah. Um, yes. But uh, right, yeah, you, the, the, you're, you're right. So why is this not enough? Um, but then you, maybe not the other way. Maybe the, there's no map guaranteed from W tensor W to W. Maybe. Uh, sorry, W. Yeah. Um, or, or equally, equally is that zero. The same. It would be the same thing. Um, yeah. Maybe going that way is also a challenge. Are you Maps both ways to yeah. run the argument for yes. for yes. the Jiangsu algebra. Okay. Yeah. Um. So if you uh go through the, the Jiangsu algebra argument, um, they, they do it. They construct an explicit intertwining. They do it in stages. So they go from the the square, the two dimensional block, to some sort of restricted one dimensional kind of diagonal mm -hmm. grid thing, and then they construct a nice morphism from that grid, uh, to the the one dimensional just the interval. And um, you can try to do a similar thing in the W or Z zero case, but it doesn't quite work because you you don't have the maps. Some of the maps don't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, or they 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 kind of frustratingly almost exist. You can kind you can get maps. Um, you, you can get unitaries going around, but the unitaries are not continuous. You, so you don't necessarily get star morphs. It's, um, it, it's Frustrating how close you can get, but I don't know. So. Thank you. Other questions? So, so actually, I, I maybe I don't know. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know. In Said's result, does he actually? Proof that Z is isomorphic to Z tensor Z, or does he oh. use? I think he. Okay, so I think he's even in the audience. So yeah, he's still listening. He can us. answer. I thought he showed it was uh, showed something equivalent to. I'm, I'm not sure. Like, uh, oh. Um, Uh, Karen, um, we cannot hear you, Dijon. I don't know if it's just me or. Yeah, I, I don't hear anything. I hear you, Said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I stopped uh, hearing, uh, like the technology broke, perhaps. Yeah, same here. I also don't hear them anymore. I see. I don't know if Karen knows about this. No idea what happened. Tristan, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly what happened. I'm I'm upstairs, like recording. So yes, you're upstairs. I know, but <laughs> it's not that far. <laughs> yeah, Johnny, Yeah, I I mean I I think they can hear us, right? 
Bishan, not yeah. if you can hear us. No, I don't know. Okay, okay, I'll try and run downstairs and just see if they, mm -hmm. they realize. Hang on. Yeah. No, oh, that's going to get very bad. Maybe you have two microphones. Hi, Karen. Nice to see you. <laughs> but I cannot hear you. Yeah, I'm not sure if they can hear us. Mm -hmm. Karen, maybe you can turn off speakers on your laptop, but try to turn off your microphone on your computer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, test. test. Yeah, now, now I can hear something. Hmm. Now I don't hear. Yeah, neither do I. Probably we can hear you from your laptop. Uh, yeah, I think we're having some. No. That's weird. Uh, that's okay. I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to answer uh, Karen's question. Uh, she mentioned if I proved that is self-absorbing there. Said probably other people can hear you, so you can answer. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, sorry, I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to mention when uh, Karen, uh, you asked if, um, yeah, in my paper, I showed a Z tensor Z. Um, is that yes, uh, but I, actually, I, yeah, essentially what I did was showing that uh, in a sort of extended category uh, that contains some tensor products of the blocks, um, Z and Z tensor Z, they become uh, price uh, limits of, actually weak price limits of uh, that category and therefore by the uniqueness, they must be isomorphic. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention. So it's not quite price limit, but it's a big price limit. 
I yeah. have to say, if I can say something, that I think that Said's argument is replicable. I mean, could be replicable, not, it, not that it is. It's difficult mm -hmm. to replicate it, but it could be replicable. Uh, the main issue is that uh, the treatment of maps between single and double blinding blocks, uh, even if there are some, these maps are there, but the treatment of all maps, uh, it's incredibly complicated. Yes, you know, you're completely right. I, mean, I noticed that when I, I had a, a, a first attempt to uh, work with this uh, um, blocks for W, I realized that, yes, the treatment of the maps are going to be very different essentially because they're not unital. So you don't have these first and second factor embeddings. So things get uh, very complicated. Yeah, not only you don't have nice ones, it's only, it's also like you start having some algebraic K1 twist and mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be doable, uh, but it would require uh, some effort, some, some yeah, large yeah. effort. Yeah, I also believe, to, yeah. To uh, what I understand, I mean, of course. Yeah. Right, yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess we cannot hear Karen, but uh, I think she's announcing the next week's speaker or, or she, she was about to do that. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Test. Test. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we yes. Okay. Oh, to turn it off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for Thank the uh, answer. Uh, sorry, we couldn't respond before now. Yeah. The best is to cut the cable. <laughs> yeah. No, I was trying to figure out how to do that, but uh, I, I finally did, apparently. But yeah. Anyway, for those who are still here, please join us next week when uh, Ali will give a talk on uh, the weak traceful approximate representability for actions of finite uh, groups on C-star algebras. Uh, yes, I guess, I guess goodbye for now. There's no more questions.